Hello, I'm Chara. I'm a competitive Splatoon player who specializes in Octobrush and Rapid Blaster. I've played Octobrush competitively since the first game, and I'm one of the most experienced players with the weapon. Currently, I'm the only top-level Octobrush player, and while I don't do much solo, I've gotten 2700 with the weapon in only a few sessions. So today, I want to help give advice on how to rank up. I'll be going over my thoughts and advice on how to play the weapon over a solo queue session I did very recently. These tips can help anyone, from someone very new to the weapon to someone very experienced, regardless of your rank. Finally, if you enjoy my content, you can be sure to subscribe, as I post a lot of competitive info, especially about Octobrush. So, if you want to learn more, I'm always up to help. Anyway, I hope you enjoy. For this session, I will be using the regular Octobrush kit. Auto Bomb is the best sub weapon for it, since it's a bomb that doesn't use a lot of ink, allowing you to both poke with it and not run out of ink when it's used in fights. The inkjet is also very useful, since it has a lot of carry potential and can help pressure weapons far outside your range. It's also only 170p, meaning you can get inkjet very fast if you paint. One of the most important things to keep in mind about Octobrush is that your kill time is actually fairly slow for your range. You'll see as I fight this sploosh that I'm trying to keep my distance so I can respect its faster kill time. After that, I use my inkjet to help finish off the 52, since my team is diving on him and he has Booyah Bomb that he could use to help maintain his HP. When playing Octobrush, you want to try to be aware of the entire map. You can see that my teammate does an ouch on the right side of the map, and it's indicating that there's opponents coming from that direction. So I'm going to rotate to a defensive position in order to try to help my team maintain zone control. Dynamo is a pretty long-range weapon with a big hitbox, so rather than trying to rush it head-on, I'm going to use my inkjet to help my team take it down. I also run drop roller on my inkjet. As you'll see throughout this session, it's very helpful with protecting your inkjet landing. I opt to get behind the Booyah Bomb user to help easily take it down once it's thrown. After that, I'm in a very awkward position for the opponents to hit me, which means I can safely play under the ledge and use the height advantage to clean up the opponents, winning this game. Piranha Pit happens to be an excellent stage for the importance of changing your position. As you saw throughout the match, I had to rotate between many different approach options and angles to best help my team. Since I'm a short-range weapon, it's very important to be in the right place at the right time, so trying to be aware of where your opponents are coming from is a big help when playing this weapon. You can see my gear here, which I won't get into too much detail. I mentioned the drop roller, but I personally prefer to use a lot of swim speed to help my mobility and move across the map. A lot of people prefer Ninja Squid, since it hides your trail. However, I personally don't like the speed slowing down effect that it has. However, both high amounts of swim speed and Ninja Squid are perfectly fine builds, so use whichever one you have for preference. But for me, I like to be able to switch in different positions of the map as fast as possible, so I go with the swim speed build at least for most maps. I noticed the roller on the right side of the map, but I want to be really careful when approaching it. The one shot of that roller is very threatening to me, and I can't afford to peek out and get hit first, so I opt to play much more safe and keep my distance against the weapon. I ain't jet afterwards to finish off the roller, but my teammates actually get him in time, so it ends up being kind of a waste. I see that the roller and 96 are trying to push in. I don't want to challenge a 1v2 head-on, so instead I back up to this ledge position where I can play a bit more safe and try to maintain an area near the zone. My mini spalling is also here, meaning I can play with someone and have a little bit of help. Eventually, my team capitalizes and pushes in on the position, forcing the opponents back since we have better map control. I get a pick on the ink brush as well, which is really useful for slowing down its armor. Even though they cap the zone, we quickly get mid control back, and I get another kill on the 96 by sneaking up on him. In this situation, we have plenty of map control, and I have my special, so I opt to poke with auto bombs, and then once I notice that the opponents are going to push towards where I am, I shark and don't make much movement. 
so the opponents don't know that I'm here still. I get a quick ambush kill in the 96, and once I see that the roller has dropped as well, I use my inkjet to safely finish him off from a distance, which wins us the next team fight. At this point in the match, there's very little time and we have a ton of map control. I shark underneath a common drop position to get a free pick on the 96, since they have to go to zone at this point. After that, I go back to make sure we don't lose zone control and get a pick on the tri Slasher, winning us the game. In solo, maintaining your life is very important. As you can see, there are some engagements that are better off not taking until you have your team's help. Sometimes it can take a while, but never take too risky engagements. It's not often worth the reward. Even if you get a trade, that's not always something you want. Maintaining your life is just much more important. This next match is a good example of an aggressive lobby. Every weapon in the game here is either short or mid-range, and both teams are running double ink armor, which is a very aggressive special. So, we're gonna have to play a lot more carefully. But, on the bright side, we don't have to deal with any long-range threats. I tried to play this engagement carefully, but unfortunately I didn't see the K-Shot and was one flick away from killing him when he got his ink armor. I start off this team fight by dropping on the 96 since he's very close to me. After that, rather than sharking, I want to get map control and my special, so I paint around and use my inkjet to pressure the people on the left side. I notice the K-Junior dropping on me because of the torpedo locking onto me, which allows me to react and kill him. After that, I run away to bait people to rush me and turn around and get a kill. Rolling away as Octobrush can be amazing bait, as oftentimes people will chase you for the kill. I didn't manage to get the 96, but I definitely did a lot of damage in that fight. After coming out of spawn, I notice people trying to push on the left side, and the K Junior uses his bubble combo. I keep my distance from the bubbles to avoid getting one shot, and then clean up the end zap as he drops into our map control. Here, I made a poor assumption that the 96 would farm armor on the right side of the map, so I waste my inkjet, and he ends up jumping out. This is a bit of a poor use of special, as now I didn't really accomplish anything, and the 96 is just going to paint for armor on the left side of the map. Even though my team won this fight, it's important to still be proactive. Rather than just sharking around, I'm painting to maintain map control and secure a better position, and poking auto bombs at the places where opponents tried to move in. After that, I get a good kill on the splatter shot coming in from the right side. Positioning under ledges is very useful for fights since it helps cover you and doesn't really interrupt your ability to hit opponents. I end up getting picked by the end zap here since the Kensa Jr. bubble combo weakens me, but we maintain zone control. I'm extra careful poking in this position since it's very open and the opponents can get a kill on me. After that, I continue to use auto bombs to help pressure the main entry point and find a kill on the Kensa Jr. I'm maintaining my life here, which is very good, and applying pressure on the main entry point. Unfortunately, the suction bomb peeks over the ledge a tiny bit, which I didn't notice. When you're pushing back in without map control, rather than diving on people, it's best to both paint the map and poke with your bomb. This will help you get more map control to push back in, be more patient for your team, and get you your special weapon, which can be really useful on retakes. I get a kill on the zap since he goes really far forward for me, and the momentum on the conveyor helps push me forward. After that, I inkjet to help double team the splattershot user, which gets us the zone control. In this situation, I need to be more careful when poking the end zap. He has a lot of map control and ink armor when he's dropped in. I opt to play high ground and behind cover, so I don't expose myself to get killed, and only approach when I have armor and again, stay on the high ground. A K-Shot drops for me as well, meaning I can't take a head-on fight. I poke them and play different angles, but mostly focus on moving around. I end up getting a trade since most of my team goes down, 
but it's still a good example of making sure you play more patiently and slowly to stall fights out. I shark on this side of the map since it's turf I haven't painted over, which makes it a lot harder to notice. My team goes all down, so I make the poor decision of taking a fight here. It would have been much better to just jump out and regroup. I end up getting a double because I'm playing with a lot of cover, but I have no way of preserving my life here. Since I notice our 52 is being pushed, I opt to shark a bit more and bait the opponents forward, then get a kill on the K-Shot who wasn't expecting me to be there. After that, I can back up and safely paint the conveyor and the zone, since the 96 is the only player alive. I ink jet here to help put some more pressure and stall the opponents from pushing in. Since I can play high ground and the opponents don't have a lot of range, ink jets on turf like this can work very well. After that, I manage to find a kill on the zap player, which wins us the game. One mistake I see from a lot of Octobrush or similar types of weapons is that people tend to shark a lot with it. The weapon here paints very well and has a bomb to poke, so you want to be putting on constant pressure and only sharking when you have plenty of map control and know you can get a kill or hold a good position. I like to go this way at the start because it has a lot of different options for terms of what I want to do. You can poke, paint with bombs, and play near the conveyor to bait approaches. It's really easy to rotate to whichever side of the map the opponents are going for. In this case, I push the left side on the junior because he doesn't really have many options to fight an octobrush and find a second kill. We quickly maintain map control, and I ink jet to put more pressure on the tetra. He ends up dropping, so I just put jetpack pressure to ensure that we get that kill. While I poke the junior here, I decide not to engage in this fight, since I'm really vulnerable to being pushed from mid. As you can see, the opponents quickly take that side of the map, so if I stayed in the area with the junior, I would have gotten picked off by other players. Retreating to this side of the map allows me to play with more cover and with my team, allowing me to find two kills on opponents that are being really greedy. Sometimes it's really good to know when to back up and play more defensive. Octorush can pick a fight and then retreat out of it very quickly, which can be extremely helpful in engagements. As you can see, even by playing defensively, I'm able to maintain an area of map control and put sufficient pressure on the other players, limiting where they can go and helping my team in fights. Since the opponents seem to be mostly pushing from this left side right now, I opt to play under this ledge. It's really useful cover, and anyone who drops is basically instantly dead. As you can see, I find two picks from opponents that are going really far in. After that, I farm the rest of my inkjet and continue to put more bombs and inkjet pressure at a distance. I force someone to drop by using my inkjet on this left side, and my teammates help finish him off. Drop roller could be an absolute lifesaver, and I again pressure someone else going on this left side of the map. Taking this fight with the junior is okay here because I have a very good matchup advantage and my teammates have plenty of kills and map control to be able to maintain while I'm gone. After that though, I'd be sure to quickly rotate back and be ready to help when needed. Since I get chipped by the suction bomb, I opt to play much more defensively with the rest of my inkjet to make sure I can survive and recall, which helps me stay alive. If I took a bit more damage, I would have died to the person camping my landing.
This match was a good example of players repeating bad habits over and over. In this case, a lot of players dropped on the left side without much map control. If you're playing against opponents who are making consistent mistakes that you're able to punish, it's perfectly reasonable to try to punish them more often. So position near where they're making mistakes and always capitalize on messed up positioning. It'll be a great way to secure an opening pick for any team fight. In this team fight, the enemies are entirely focused on the left side of the map, so I'm instead going to focus on farming my inkjet since I don't have to worry about anyone rushing me, and then use my jetpack to help displace people, and in this case help pick off the heavy that my teammates are trying to push, and move someone else towards the right side. If people aren't pushing you, you either need to reposition, paint, or poke with bombs. Always try to be productive with what you're doing. In this situation, I should have been more careful knowing that the Slosher was over there. Slosher has a lot more range and a fairly big hitbox, so it can be really tricky to rush down. If you're playing against one, you want to be careful and make sure you get the first hit or sneak in. Don't ever engage one head-on by rushing it. I notice my Brella distracting and trying to stall the Slosher, so I go to help him. Unfortunately, the conveyor slows me down, so I end up killing him late. I then panic inkjet since I see the burst bomb launcher and was very weak to it, and I try to use it to pressure the heavy. Once I recall, I'm focused on trying to maintain map control and maintain presence on the Dapple since he dropped into our map. After chasing him for a little bit, we find the kill, and then I go to help my Gluga push the heavy on the right side, getting a kill on him as well, though it is a bit laggy. Octobrush can be very good at rotating and helping team fights, so if you see teammates taking an engagement, you always want to be able to try to help them. In this case, I opt to push the T-Tech since he has very little map control and then turn around on the Dapple Dooley, who's already weak. After pressuring the Slosher, I decide to give up the engagement and simply take pain control. I can use my inkjet to pressure the Slosher a lot safer, and once again stall on the left side. The Dapple doesn't drop, unfortunately, so he maintains his life in this situation. Here I just straight up end up feeding, getting very greedy for a good position. It happens to everyone sometimes, you gotta respect longer range weapons more, so be a bit careful about that. Just a good example of why a sub and bomb defense is helpful. A lot of combos in the game that would normally kill you don't. This time, I played a lot more safely and slowly when approaching the heavy, successfully denying him from this position. With two people on me, I opted to stall the fight and just play safe. I get a trade with the slosher, which isn't optimal but isn't bad either. I drop on the T-Tech here since he's facing the other way and is preoccupied with an opponent, which means it's a lot harder for him to react in time to kill me. After that, I drop again on the Dapple and Slosher, trying to back out in time, but unfortunately just get angled a bit too hard. Once again, I notice two of my teammates taking a fight on the right side of the map, so I rotate to help them out with it. After that, I use another inkjet to again pressure someone I know on the top left, the Dapple, who in this case drops and gets picked off by me. After that, I just play mostly safe against the Slusher and wait for my inkjet recall.
Here's another good example of a situation where it's better to be proactive than shark. In this case, I poke with auto bombs to make it a lot harder for the slosher to approach and to force drops, which ends up getting a kill. I'm also painting and actively maintaining the zone. When I do shark, it's to focus on the kill on the right side after knowing the left side of the map is already taken care of by the rest of my team. Then I can safely cover the drop to get a few more kills and stay to finish off the heavy after his booyah bomb. That was the last game. I hope these examples provided a good amount of situations to help you improve your Octobrush play. My main point is that you want to focus on being proactive, making sure you paint and poke with your bombs, and rotate to help your team frequently whenever they need it for fights. The last thing I want to add is not to overextend. If you have to take a fight and it goes poorly, you can always retreat early. Not getting the kill is okay in a lot of situations. With that being said, I hope this guide helped. Thank you for watching.